All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the afternoon session of uh, Drupal South Shorts. Um, if you could find yourselves a seat. <laughs> Little in-person joke. Um, so this afternoon, we've got the DevOps stream for the next 45 minutes. Uh, my name's Toby Bellwood. I'm the product lead at Amazie IO. Um, we've got, um, in this session, we've got Margie Sonak from Morphed, um, who's going to be talking to you a little about Docker, letting you know what Docker is all about and how it works and some of the experiences with it. And then we're going to pivot seamlessly into a conversation about DevOps. And we've got some star guests that will be part of our roundtable for DevOps. So as we go through the presentation, think of your really good DevOps questions, line them up, hit them in the Q&A, live Q&A section, um, and we'll try and get to them as we go to the panel after the session. But I'd like to welcome Margie up on stage. Hello, guys. Yeah, OK, good. So I'm Margie. I'm from Morphed. I'm uh, one of the two co-founders, co um, and I'm a DevOps engineer. That's what I do most of the time, helping our developers get better code into production. Um, this is a DevOps roundtable, as Toby said. Thank you, Toby, for the introduction. Um, but uh, I thought I would have a little lightning, sec uh, lightning talk about um, Docker. Uh, we were hoping to attract some people to this. So this is just a little bit of lightning talk about Docker and the hardcore, or my, doesn't have to be, uh, discussion will be after. So. Let's try again. There are no doubts that you have Docker already somewhere. Uh, because Docker is everywhere. Hosting providers have been using Docker for years. Uh, GovCMS, the current uh, version of GovCMS, runs Docker uh, on Kubernetes or OpenShift. CIs these days use Docker containers. GitHub Action lets you choose at the beginning what that you want to run it on Ubuntu, you have to choose what container to run your um, pipeline on. And local development uses Docker heavily. You can see here, like if you use Lando, use Docker. If you use GovCMS, Ahoy, and Pygmy, um, Pygmy, um, you use Docker. Doxel, you use Docker. I think people basically use Docker every day when they develop. This slide is just to uh, pause a little bit on what Docker is, you know, because I still remember when Docker came, um, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago, 12, 10 years ago, uh, we were calling it virtualization. But these days, it's just, it's it's basically like a platform for developing, shipping, and running applications. You put them in a Docker container and then run them somewhere. And you run them using the OS level virtualization capability. So Docker itself is not a virtualization. It's a, it's a way of shipping, developing, and running containers. It's just funny that I borrowed this definition from the Docker.com website. You can see they didn't say open source platform. They just said open platform. You can see that it's an enterprise now. Docker terminology, just the basic one. There is a Docker image, a Docker container, and Docker Hub. I have seen people having a little bit of uh, difficulties to identify what is what. I mean, developers who just run Ahoy up uh, and um, not sure about the terminology. So I thought I would make out just a little bit of a little bit of talk. So you have, um, so you need to build your Docker, uh, con uh, Docker image somehow. You either build it yourself by running a Docker build, or you may pull already existing image. And if you pull existing image, you will do it from the registry, which is on the right. Uh, very, very often Docker Hub frequently, but this day you have also GitHub uh, container registry. <clears throat> and then you start it. And when you start it, you take the image and you make a, a running container from that image. And you can have more than one. So that's basically all these three topics. Um, I just came up with a little metaphor, how to think of Docker image. Docker image is like, I think of it as a binary, as a package you download. Say you download Firefox on your Mac, you downloaded that package. And then Docker container is that package running, the program running, and it can run multiple times. When you run the Firefox, you install, when you run it, you can run it multiple times if you have uh, multiple profiles 
So that's basically how image and uh, Docker image and Docker container work. And another funny um, metaphor I came up with is that if you are a PHP developer, you can think of the Docker uh, image as a PHP class with all its definition. And then when you instantiate the class, you create the object, uh, many of them, more than one, you can make create more than one object from that uh, class. You know, uh, that's actually the running container. Here, I'm just showing you how you can run a program without installing anything. So here, I decided to execute the Kaosei program. I didn't have anything installed. I just have Docker installed. And you can see that it's actually pulling the image on the second line because I don't have it locally. So it pulls it from the uh, registry. Uh, in this case, it will be Docker Hub. Um, and then it, it starts it. And because I gave it the parameter hello Drupal South, you can see that um, it popped up in there. Well, is it a whale? Uh, because somebody took the original, and this, this is coming back, how is a Docker um, image built? And uh, there is a file called Docker file. And this is um, a definition of this previous program I just showed you here. So this is how how the how how the image got built. So you see that it, they are using um, Debian stretch as a base image. So there is a Docker image which which has Debian stretch in it. That's that's the start. Then you just install the Kaosei uh, package uh, apt package inside that, and then you copy your I think it's the ASCII car art, the Docker cow, that, that basically, that, that, that's this, you know, uh, the whale. And uh, that's it. And then you say for what should be executed if you don't provide any parameters. That, that's how easy it is. So in Docker file, you define how to build your container. I also just want to, uh, I can see people mixing Ahoy and Docker together, especially people who have been doing just GAP CMS uh, and nothing else. And, and they run Ahoy up. And so from for them, Ahoy and Docker are very things which belong together. I'm saying they have nothing in common. They are two different things. And it's because um, Ahoy is just a tool of uh, defining commands in a YAML syntax and saying, if I say Ahoy Margie, it executes this. If I say Ahoy Peter, it, it executes that. So when you look at the definition of Ahoy PS, and this is the output output how Ahoy PS looks like. You can see containers there, um, GAP CMS containers. Um, the definition is the first four lines. It actually runs Docker Compose PS. So when I run Ahoy PS, uh, it executes Docker Compose PS. So the Ahoy is just a wrapper, as I said. Uh, Docker Compose, because I just talked about Docker Compose. So it, it's it's a tool for running multi-container applications together. So here is a, just a quick example of how to run a stack for Drupal. So I have three services. I have MySQL service. I have a web server running from Nginx. Um, and I have a Drupal container, which is PHP FPM. And you can see that the Nginx, the last one in the middle, the Drupal, they share the slash web directory. That's where the code of your website is. And um, there are dependencies. You can see that the Drupal service depends on MySQL and the web server uh, depends on Drupal. Um, that's, that's, that's all it is, and it's very simple. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention in my 10-minute talk is just um, uh, about developers running um, their containers without really looking at the containers, which might be uh, the case of Cap CMS development. Uh, you might end up with, with very old images or too many images on your uh, system. So it's always good to look at uh, whether you have images you don't need obsoleted. So, you know, by running commands like Docker uh, image uh, or Docker PS and uh, looking at, sorry, uh, looking at images which might be stopped but not being used. So uh, there are commands which you can use to clean up. For example, this one I provided here, Docker system prune. When you execute that, that offers you to delete every single image which is not currently running and um, uh, also, the networks related to that—that's—that's that's a big 
clean up. I don't want to talk about the details now, but you need to know that you have uh, images and there might be many versions of them and uh, you need to clean up now and then otherwise you will run out of the space. Uh, one, one detail I want to um, mention here because I have seen people hitting it. Uh, you see here, I have, uh, when, when you basically, uh, when, when you refer to an image, when you start a image and say latest, it looks at your local, um, whether you have image already and it's called latest. And if it's not, it downloads the latest image. So say you're running up CMS and you have uh, PHP 7 latest, and you did that a half a year ago. And then half a year later, you again, you want to start PHP latest. And Docker daemon looks whether you have the latest image already. And if, if you do, it starts it. But you might be actually running a half a year old image because you, you said latest and you did not explicitly pull the current latest uh, from the repository. So just be aware of the latest doesn't mean latest until you verify that you don't uh, you actually docker pull that latest one and uh, i also find it really helpful to actually put the the specific version of the image because the latest always maps to a specific version of that uh, container image to be sure what you are actually running because latest on my laptop might be php latest on my laptop might be completely different docker image than php latest on my colleague's laptops just be aware of that i have seen developers not realizing that and struggling with old code without actually knowing why that's i think that's most of that i wanted to say there is just one a practical example i thought i would offer as, as just a little bit of, to think about for example if i run backstop um, JS, which is a um, um, regression um, tool for uh, regression testing. Um, I use this alias on my machine. Uh, so when I run backstop, it basically starts a backstop container. If it's not present on my system, it downloads it. Um, and it mounts my, uh, where is it? My, my current directory I'm executing this backstop command from and, and runs that. So I can jump to any directory when I have backstop uh, files, back, back, backstop um, config files, and run backstop uh, without any installation, without having, having any dependencies. And I can do it on my local, and then I can do the same within a CI. This is just an example. And if this looks really horrible when you look at that, what it just executes Docker um, called backstop. And I try to mask Google Analytics doing like DNS poisoning. So I'm actually not hitting um, statistics for the site when I'm uh, analyzing it. But it's very simple. You did once and you have a tool. So uh, what I want to show by this example that you can have multiple tools like that, which are actually wrappers over Docker commands. And you don't need to know about them, but they are easy to run. That's basically all I wanted to say. I know it was a little bit like bum, 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 but I didn't want to go into any details. I just want to uh, tell you a lightning talk. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks very much, Margie. Um, quick question for me. How many is too many Docker images to have on your local machine? <laughs> it really depends on your memory. <laughs> <laughs> I have 32 gigabyte now, and uh, when I have more than 20, I can I can feel that. It really depends how how they are running, how many CPU. I, I, how, and, yeah, I know. I, that was a joke. Thank I just you. checked. <laughs> I've got 590 Docker images, and I system oh. pruned about a week ago. So Maybe they are uh, idling. <laughs> Running, uh, running close to the limit. Um, OK, so thank you very much, Marty, for the talk. Um, what we'll do now is we'll pivot seamlessly into a sort of round table about DevOps. I'm going to bring a couple of extra people up to the stage. But if you've got questions, put them in the live Q&A tool thing, and we'll see those, and we'll see if we can get an answer to them. And um, we'll take it from there. I'm just waiting for, there we go. Greetings, everybody. So um, if we want to do a quick round of intros, let us know who you are and why you DevOps. I'll go first. Um, my name's Nick Shu. I'm ops lead at Previous Next. And I DevOps because I like to help people. I think that's, <laughs> I yeah, no, I, I generally, I think that's kind of the line like I, I worked in help, like a help desk thing for five years and then built tools there and then kind of went in, I went and said I wanted to be a developer and then 
and then kind of went into DevOps because I was trying to help developers. So yeah, that's that's my reason. <laughs> I'll go next. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm also Nick, Nick Santa Maria, uh, Senior DevOps Engineer at um, the Victorian Department of Premier and Cabinet. Uh, I DevOps because I needed an escape plan from Drupal, but uh, that hasn't worked too well because I just keep working for Drupal companies. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, and I'm Tom Turgood, I'm Head of Sales at Amazio. Uh, based in Auckland, New Zealand, um, and I DevOps. Yeah, I, I guess I like Nick's answer around um, you know helping make make developers' lives easier. But at the same time, I'm also uh, an automation nut. Um, just love anything about automating things and tinkering. So uh, that's another reason I got into DevOps. Awesome. Well, I might head straight into a a, a shameless linker question. Um, and off the back of Margie's talk. How do you think Docker has influenced the DevOps landscape? I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. I think it's it basically invented the DevOps landscape <laughs> um, in a way. It, it really uh, revolutionized every aspect from uh, local development, continuous integration, development environments, production now with Kubernetes. Every single touch point is now containerized and um, and that was not possible. Well, not widely available until Docker came along and um, built their great tool. Kind of reinvigorated it a little bit too, like the DevOps movement, because before that it was kind of, you know, standard, you know, host infrastructure, like very, you know, like, robust standard infrastructure, but then like all these talks around, okay, how do we bridge the gap between dev and ops and, you know, certain people like big organizations taking that leap, but then, but the smaller ones, not as much, I guess, because it, it was really a, and is really like a movement around people. And, um, and if anything, like the Docker movement just through, yeah, just accelerated the heck out of it with tooling but then invigorated everybody and then got them to, you know, get on the bandwagon as well and kind of rethink their processes in the meantime. So, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. And it also sort of lowered the barrier to entry. I think it, it sort of made it a lot easier. I mean, traditionally you were dealing with, you know, um, you know data centers, servers, this sort of thing. Um, and it, although the DevOps principles were around, it was just a lot harder to, to deal with, right? So this really brought it down, um, you know, to your local machine where you can build everything, replicate everything, you know, and then take that all the way through the stack through your, your CI and production things. I still remember when, you know, I was starting with infrastructure as code 15 years ago. There was no way how we'd run it on your local, right? You were running it on servers, but that, that completely changed. You can still have infrastructure as code, but you actually run it on your little little laptop that's a beautiful thing i don't know how many hours i wasted packaging virtual machine images for vagrant to save other people from having to you know run like puppet or scripts or things like that to actually fire up an environment like just for the docker piece like yeah that was pretty huge <laughs> so um but but think about the company too like like the docker company like started with the tool and then the company kind of grew around it and became this massive beacon and then kind of led the way and now it's sort of shrinking back down if anything to more of that initial tool so it's very it's very interesting to see that journey as well quick uh, quick throwaway question from sean what's your favorite docker image what's your go-to margie's is obviously Kause. <laughs> that was fine <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it's my favorite, but I was looking for something people would know and it's trivial. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> my my favorite image is Pygmy. Pick me up. Uh, <laughs> the Lagoon CLI, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I use the most. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's probably gonna turn into hosting shameless plugs here. So I'll skip a CLI. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just scrolling through right now. <laughs> most used one is uh, the AWS CLI because I can just never get Python 
installed natively and not have issues with, you know, Python 3 and Python 2. And that, that goes back to Marju's point about being able to run your tools inside images. Um, I stumbled across Whale Brew last year or the year before, and that's Homebrew, but in Docker images. So um, most of your favorite tools are ported into Docker images and runnable by a single command, um, if you like that kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, when we talk about DevOps, you can't ignore the the more recent trend that is talking like it's DevOps is becoming DevSecOps. Um, be really interesting to know how, particularly as, as people who run sort of large infrastructures um, in the DevOps space, how do you go about performance and security monitoring? It's tricky, right? Because it is that it because it is that DevOps factor. Like it is the people. Like uh, like one question, you know, like that gets thrown to around like that security focused. Like folk, folks kind of instinctually go, oh, like ops should answer that. But it's like no, no, no. It's also the apps. Like it, it's it's the whole picture. You know, everybody kind of has to work together. Otherwise, you know, your infrastructure could be as secure as as anything, and it doesn't matter if you know if people aren't. If, if it's not happening on the other side and vice versa. So it's like security is definitely a, you know, one of those things like a, that really teases out, you know, comms between teams and people working together more than just, you know, take more than maybe like the wall that we set up with all these toolings where we went, just package an image and then we'll ship it for you. You know, that was kind of like the, you know, where the DevOps movement used to be about like, let's talk and collaborate. Maybe the, oh, maybe the tools went a little too far, you know, and automated away all those comms and you can't really automate around security. So, and having those discussions. So, yeah. Anybody else want to take it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm happy. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think De DevSecOps is, you know, a big movement. It's sort of a subset of the DevOps movement. It's really, really grown in interest in the last couple of years and trying to really bring that that shift left model um, into security whereas the old classic model was you build your application you deliver it you hand it over to some security team to pen test it or do a review and then knock it back and patch it the idea is you, you're bringing in this automation tooling into your devops workflow and um, you know code scanning static analysis um, whole bunch of tools that you can do and actually catch things as early as possible um, and, you know, we're seeing, a, you know, a lot of encouraging use out of this and um, it's becoming really, really important to, um, you know, if you can get this, the, you know, you're getting your deployment processes up and faster, if you have to wait for security to come back, it really slows things down. So, um, yeah, lots of scope and lots of exciting um, uh, new enhancements on that area for sure. I'd hate to focus on the tools, but are there any tools that, like are enabling you to do that shift shift to left? Um, I mean, there's a whole bunch of tools you can plug in. Um, you know, I mean, you know, some of the things that even Git, like GitHub brings to you, like the Git Guardian, you know, coming through and actually scanning your repository for, for you know, sensitive information. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's other other tools that I probably can't think of right now, but, um, you know, there's, uh, yeah, it, it, it totally depends on the use case. Um, I think back to your point, Nick, that, that probably the number one thing that anyone can do is uh, good code reviews um, and just making sure that the stuff that's getting in there is sanity checked. Ooh, when, uh, um, played around with the idea of adding some, you know, like a, you know, trivy sort of vulnerability scanning to our, to our build pipeline. And uh, it just raises some potential risks around uh, you know, what do you do if there's a vulnerability, but it, you know, you, you feel that the, the risk is low enough that you're happy to deploy it. So, you know, having those as kind of build gates is um, not a solved problem for us, but definitely something we're considering. Yeah, and there, and there can be a lot of noise, right? I mean, we, we use trivia as well, <laughs> um, you know, especially when it's coming from upstream dependencies, right? It's, which is completely out of your control. So, mm. yeah, it's, it's definitely a balance um, that you have to sort of achieve. I think I read a study which says that 
you know, like one third of all the official images have some kind of like vulnerability built in because they have all, I cannot find the document, but that, that was like half a year ago. So like even the, you trust that image, you know, because it's like official PHP image. Well, hopefully that one is simple enough and you can look at the source, but they are complex images you trust and you have no idea what you are running. And you, you know, <laughs> that's one thing. And also, if you guys have seen uh, GitHub Actions, if you use GitHub GitHub Actions and you, you see these, uh, what is it called, Actions, to actually run in, inside your, um, the, the repositories, the, the plugins, whatever, I, I forgot the terminology. So people just use many of them, but none of them are endorsed by GitHub. Like there are only like a few of them and you are running somebody else's code from their master, you know, and you are not realizing that they put it in the customer pipeline and you are not realizing that. So I started, like I have a few clients, we have a few clients who use these and, and say, okay, you either have to fork it so you can audit it, or at least you need to lock it to a commit. So you actually know that, you know, that, that commit you, you, nobody can tamper with that commit because you have looked at it, you, audited it and you say, I know that this commit has nothing evil in it. Like, but it's just like blindly running the latest in your pipeline. You never know when they inject something, you know, like this is such a, I, I can see this coming. This is. But that's been a problem a long time. You know, I remember people used to give, um, you know, a lot of heat around curling to bash, right? You know, just having a one line curl back. Some, you know, products recommend that's the installation process, but effectively pulling down a Docker container is, pretty similar right they can contain um serious things so that that image scanning can be pretty important uh, it's it's kind of going to the attacker like instead of previously where it was like you know curl bash like what would you like to run it's like what would you like to run plus what tools would you like to ex like you know to come with it too do you you know like it's it, yeah yeah fully tested um, you know, vulnerability. <laughs> As someone who spends a lot of their time in upstream Docker images, yeah, it's it's a minefield out there. Like I can trust the official ones, the official PHP image, the official Python image, but every so often you come across a fantastic tool that is too good to be true, and you're like, well, how how long can I pull it from this person's repository for before? they push a weird image and I know nothing about it. And yet commit signing is one way of getting around pulling the sort of the commit hash of the, of the Docker image, but you've just got to be so vigilant and coming to Tom's point of shift left, it's no longer a security guy who sort of pops out his head at, head at the office once every couple of weeks and goes, Hey, I've done a security audit and I found this. We've all got the tools now. We've all now got the responsibility and, um, yeah, the tools are being produced, like Trivi. Um, there's a couple of other really good software bill of materials type tools. The in, the onus is on the developer to know what they're using. We're familiar with it from a like a composer packagist NPM paradigm, but yeah, I don't think we think fully enough about it from a, a Docker point of view, particularly. Um, and the same goes for the other side, like as a lot of us are platform or developers, like we are developers, just, you know, on top of platforms or development pipelines. And it's the same deal, whether it's, you know, a PH, you know, whether we're writing PHP for the platform or writing Go or writing, you know, it's all the same, same issues at that level as well. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of parallels. <laughs> So, so one question that's, that's been asked um, by Andrew is, has anybody got any tips to speed things up with uh, Docker development on Macs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> buy a Linux laptop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that, yeah, number one answer to that question is that. Um, but yeah, probably learn, learn a lot about layer caching in depth and how that works and operates and I think is the, is the best um, advice I could give. Um, yeah, it's probably the only way that I can tell. I have, okay, I have seen people struggling, <clears throat> Mac users running Lando having massive performance issues, right? I'm a Linux user myself. But recently <clears throat> looking at the queues, they I think Lando mounts your home directory, you know, like in, and <clears throat> even if you are running a little project on Lando and there is, and other <clears throat> process copying anything, modifying anything in your home directory, which is not related to your project, it's still being replicated inside, you know, like, and you are wasting, wasting this IO of, 
a virtualization for that. So th there are ways how you mount only the necessary stuff like SSH keys and things. And like, so that, that somebody pointed it out recently in the Lando issue queue that this might be a massive uh, reason because it mounts all your home inside. If you if you jump inside the Docker container running Lando, you realize that you have your home documents, movies in there. Just <laughs> <laughs> good to realize. And whatever is touching them, it's going inside. Or it's copying. So. Yeah, it's funny. The problem never really went away when it went from Vagrant to Docker Compose because it was always like a file system mounting performance style issue. So we kind of just ended up in the same realm where it was like you either use the baked in you know mount solution where you have the right permissions so you don't end up like churning your fo local files to like 777 or something really silly to get around that or you end up yeah or you end up doing like nfs like an nfs mount which is a bit more performant but more to maintain so yeah, and to just to add to that, sorry, I, I thought it was building uh, images, but yeah, for, for when you're syncing files, if you can do things like not have sync dependencies, so if you build your dependencies in your image and you don't have to sync them, that that's often a way you can um, get away with faster. There's also some really good writing out there. Um, I think, like, shameless plug for our own blog, but our number one most popular blog article was written four years ago about improving Docker performance on Mac. Um, since then, I know Jeff Geeling's done a couple of updates. There's been a couple of changes, but I think the problem the problem still exists. And it, it is sort of watch what you're mounting and make sure that you're not just blindly mounting the whole thing because that's what the default is. So really, if you're just working on a theme, mount your theme. If you're just working at like, yeah, build as much as you can in the image. Don't rush out and buy a brand new M1 Mac thinking it's all going to be sunshine, happiness, and <laughs> rainbows yeah that there was a substantial amount of rework that had to go into that from what i've seen check, check my commit, commit history sometimes oh <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah. um yeah because just to mention that you know your gov say gov cms images will not work on your new mac right because they are not built for this infrastructure just to realize like um by buying a new macbook for a developer you have to go for Intel because otherwise they will not be able to run up CMS images. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the. But it's also someone... <laughs> you're you're running different images locally, right? At that point, and you're deploying a different image as well. So I don't know. It's still unresolved. Yeah, my, so what like, are people? Oh, sorry, go to me. <laughs> like my experience of the last two weeks building like a full suite of multi-architecture. ARM 64, AMD 64 images is that, yeah, there's there's a lot of caveats in there. What Tom says is right. Essentially, you're running a different image locally than you are in production. At this stage, the chances are that it'll be more broken locally than it would be in production because most production <laughs> workloads are still running on Intel boxes. But there will be a point in the future when the running a, a Kubernetes service on the um, um, boxes in AWS or wherever is economically more feasible and suddenly the whole problem pivots and stuff that works in your local suddenly doesn't work in production because you've got that multi-image split. Um, I'm trying to build the same image at the same time for both. I, I could do a 20-minute talk on Docker build X and manifests and local registries and I still wouldn't get anywhere near <laughs> the, the actual crux of how confusing this thing is. But that's an interesting problem because, yeah, folks like AWS and like all the cloud hosting providers are getting into the silicon game and starting with their own ARM chips, which is, yeah, varying like what we thought was stable or what we thought was stable ground, not so much anymore. Um, what does everybody run for their local? Like, or, or what does their org, like what's the standard tool for like local, local Drupal development? Ours is just kind of standard Docker Compose at this point. Yeah. We, we uh, mainly use Pygmy, sorry. Yeah, Pygmy yeah. and Lando, I guess, is that split? Yeah, we, we use Lando. Uh, yeah. And for Gap CMS, we have to use Ahoy Pygmy, yeah. Hopefully, it's coming also. <laughs> I mean, into Lando. Yeah. 
yeah, and um, we're all season Doc Compose with Ahoy over the top. Um, interestingly, we've got some of our guys running Windows machines and using WSL, and it seems to go reasonably well. So there's another another curveball in the mix. At some point in the future, we're going to have to follow our DevOps tooling to Windows. I uh, sorry, sorry. I just to, to this one. I had a developer who has Windows, which is a unique unique case, but they had less trouble running Docker, um, Debian Docker packages inside uh, WSL. So they had like a local performance file system wise because the kernel, Linux kernel inside Windows is very well done and there is no trouble with file system sharing as opposed to Mac, which is 10 times slower. So like actually user on Windows with WSL2 can run a native um, Lando on native Docker without any performance issues. That's that's like a game changer. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it Ubuntu inside? It's like you're already in the VM, right? So you're you're loading up Docker. So you're already sort of virtualized in there, and then your whole. But the file system is just yeah, in, in there. there. Yeah. Yeah. So there is no performance on. That's fascinating. But, but for me, that was an eye opener, right? Like it keeps going into suddenly the Mac is the <laughs> the limping. <laughs> platform right everybody every developer running docker has trouble with performance because it's on mac <laughs> and uh you know fascinating like i've also been working quite a bit with gitpod and github code spaces over the last couple of weeks and those i think are going to be pretty game changing um being able to run essentially your local workload in a pre-provisioned container <laughs> that's built from an image and in the case of both Gitpod and um, and GitHub code spaces, you can define what the image has, you can set it up for local development, you can add the tools and people just spin it up in a browser. Like this whole Mac versus PC versus Linux, like you can do this on your iPad now. And that's, there's gonna go, I think that's gonna be a bit of a shift back to how DevOps was in that, yes, we can provide people with Docker images that run exactly the same thing, but if we can sort of provision Reprovision the environments that it's all running on. We know that people are at least should be set up for success. Mm. Yeah, and as, as an example, that like you've been building those M1 images in a cloud service of a is that a uh, Mac Mini running in the cloud. Um, so you can actually just connect into other machines to actually do most of your development, which means you don't need all that power sitting in front of you. It means you can do it from your iPad on the beach or. Skating down the center of Auckland. <laughs> Maybe. What about my IDE, man? Like, <laughs> that means I got to use VS Code. <laughs> I love VS Code, by the way. That's my I'm, IDE. I'm sure they'll have Vim in the cloud soon for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, quick question from Dennis. Um, can you recommend any training pathways courses for new joiners to enter Drupal DevOps? Like not particularly, he's asked particularly for onboarding for Gussie MSCI, Docker Drupal. But what do you think are the best resources out there for who are the people to follow? Where do we learn from? Jeff Geeling. <laughs> <laughs> That's the. It's probably unanimous. He, yep. he puts out um, great. Like he's written books on Ansible and Kubernetes. He puts out great YouTube content. Um, yeah, he's the guy. Go and follow him. Plus one to that for sure. Um, we're not specifically to Drupal. I don't know if there's anyone else I can think of that would have so much content and so much knowledge. I know yeah. this Linux Foundation runs some courses in Kubernetes and they have like multiple, they have some really good content. Like I think I have a friend yeah. working as a DevOps engineer for Linux Foundation and uh, he, he works on that testing environment. But, uh, what I have looked before, they have really interesting content, and that's how Linux Foundation makes money uh, by basically providing training and certification, Kubernetes, and you know. So I'm pretty sure there will be some. We're not supposed content. to talk about Kubernetes. <laughs> oh no, no, we are talking about DevOps. Why not? <laughs> but but that's interesting though, because like there was like, especially on my journey, like there was like very clear tentpole folks to follow like as all this stuff was happening like um 
but now it's kind of yeah it's a little bit more dis like dispersed or maybe more specialized yeah like the jeff keelings mm -hmm. and those kinds of folks like i mean you had used to have like your solomon hikes and kelty high towers and those kinds of people who you know you'd follow and kind of go on that journey with them as everybody else was but um but now yeah you're yeah it's, it's quite interesting I'd, I'd really encourage people as they're on the journey to, to document it like write about what you've done um use like the services like dev.2 um medium cough um are uh, are really good at putting your experience out there and finding other people that are doing the same sort of stuff that you are. Um, I find it really cathartic writing about what I've done because it helps really cement it in my mind. Um, I wrote a blog post last year sometime about using <laughs> using Dockerize in a Docker image with Circle CI to see if services are ready. And it's still like by far away the most popular article I've ever written. And I'm like, I... I remember doing it and thinking, this is so cool. I wish someone else had written this before me. Um, hopefully I can help someone else. But yeah, you write something from your point of view. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be polished. It doesn't have to be like cross-checked and edited and reviewed by 15 people. It's more, if it's your personal experience, it's it's good to share with people. And Maybe you too could become the next Jeff Geeling. Uh, and to close off the last question I have is, yes, Carl, this is an RGB microphone. And if I... <laughs> Red light means hot. <laughs> um, okay, a few minutes left. What's going to be the next big disruptor in the DevOps or DevSecOps space? Performance monitoring, hands down. Oh, that's that's kind of my my take on it. Like, we've... We've put all the tools in place that give us much deeper hooks into where our applications are running to the point where, um, you know, like, like take New Relic, for example, like New Relic um, was stable for a really long time. Like that was the product, like the APM was the product, but now with things like Pixie, like it is very, very compelling where it's kind of like this lower level tool where you don't need to install well, the, the guarantees or the thing that they're putting forward is the fact that you throw these agents on your entire cluster and then it'll just start to pick up performance bottlenecks and the like. I think we'll see way more of these kinds of tools and way more things pointing out application bottlenecks and performance issues that we didn't have before. So. Yeah, I can go. I mean, um, I would say it's more yeah, abstraction, basically, like a lot more abstraction where still i think we're still in the early days of that um that movement where it's all very very configurable um and you, you sort of had to be in that way um where you know you set up clusters and you put nodes and you've got to sort of tune everything i think um i think there's yeah, there's a lot of scope for that to be just abstracted away and I, you can already see some companies and products that are doing that um already uh, i don't think we're done with uh serverless and uh and yeah that and the distributed tracing and and kind of the observability capable like uh where we that a really viable system so it's kind of like a blend of tom and nick's answers i think like certainly back in the day sort of new relic and blackfire and whatever used to be really good at the application I think there's a realization now that from a DevOps point of view, there's a whole stack thing in here and it's it's not just your application. There's the infrastructure it runs on, is the infrastructure tuned, is your database tuned, is there's all these other things and there's all these layers to peel back. And it's it's not as simple as optimizing a PHP call or sorting out a, a node library. There's all these other elements that are going to impact how your application performs, how it scales, how it <laughs> performs when it isn't scaling. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's there's a lot of additional work to be done in understanding how your application runs when you when you launch. It isn't just launched. Um, it's the watching. It's the tweaking. It's the configuring. All right. Um, I'd like to thank. 
you all for your um, for questions. I'd like to thank the panelists for coming and giving up some of their afternoon to talk about DevOps. I know it's a struggle to get you four talking about DevOps. Um, so <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for attending um, this Drupal South session. It's been a fun day, and I look forward to another one in November. See you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you.